Hello, and we're back. Just go for it. Hey everybody, it's me, your buddy Dave, the host of the... Ch <laughs> Stop. Hey everybody, it's me, your buddy Dave, here at The Dark Stuff. Thanks a lot for checking out my new video. As promised, this is going to be my uh, discussion and analysis of the new replacements box set, Dead Man's Pop. What I'd like to do for the video, in all honesty, is to sit there and compare the different versions of the songs with some real depth to it. But unfortunately... The YouTube copyright police will not allow that. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my usual thing. I'm going to try to limit my samples to 10 to 15 seconds and hope that I just get under the radar. Uh, the worst that will happen, I believe, would be that I would get a copyright claim on the video. Uh, they would put an ad somewhere in the video and the ad revenue would go to the copyright holder, which I guess is okay. I don't care as long as it doesn't prevent the video from being shown. So what I will do for this video is uh, I'm going to talk about the three facets of the box set, okay? There's, um, there's a live element, which is a two-disc live record. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then there's uh, two discs of previously unheard versions of songs that you're already familiar with. But these versions are very different, and that's what we're going to spend most of the time uh, talking about. We apologize. Here they are. The replacement. What the hell are we doing here? So let's start off with the actual box itself. So here it is. It's in a hardcover book form. You know, it's really cool. Okay, these are pictures from the Don't Tell a Soul period, which is the period that we're talking about here. Okay has a great full color booklet with full credits for all the recordings great pictures and liner notes from Bob Mayer who is the writer of the the Trouble Boys book and has become the sort of the official uh, historian or whatever biographer of the replacements so if he's involved that means he's got the band's involvement and that means it's also going to be very well written and very well done. Um, I didn't know this guy until the Replacements book, but I was so impressed with the book and everything that I've seen him do subsequently in interviews and such. It's, it's really, really good. So you get a great booklet out of the deal. When you open it up, okay, you've got the four CDs there. You've got the vinyl LP here. I'm not going to take it out. It's just a black record, but that's the sleeve for it. So it's a really, really nice package. Now, in addition to the box set, if you ordered it in advance, you could get this cassette, which is outtakes, which is uh, highlights from the box and then outtakes. You can see I haven't opened it because I got downloads of the two bonus songs that are on here as part of my thank you gift for it being delayed or whatever. So that's why I got, I, I don't need to open the cassette. I'm going to keep that one sealed. So let's talk about the purpose of the box set in the first place. The purpose is to give a reevaluation to this album. The replacements, Don't Tell a Soul. Okay, those, you might recognize those photos. Um, the replacements, Don't Tell a Soul. The album was released in 1989. It was the band's seventh full length album. It's considered by many to be the band's most controversial record, and by controversial, meaning a lot of people don't like it. Old school replacements fans hated it. Um, you know, there were cries of sellout and this and that, and oh, they're, they're maturing and how booing and whatever. And, you know, it, that was the knock on it. In 1989, I was 80, I was <laughs> 89. In 1989, I was 18 years old. So I didn't have a full understanding of the history. I didn't, you know, really understand rock criticism and this and that. I was the reviewer in my high school newspaper. I reviewed the record. And at the time, I thought it was fantastic because what did I know? I'd only gotten into the band the year before. Okay. 
In addition to the album being very controversial, it's also the band's most commercially successful album. It had their biggest uh, hit song, which is I'll Be You, which was, uh, I think, barely cracked the top 50 back in 89. Um, it feels like it should have had more hits than that, but really I'll Be You was, was the main song, and that's what, you, that's what the band is actually best known for. To mainstream music fans, people who aren't fans of underground rock or whatever, who just have a, a tertiary list, uh, uh, an understanding of popular music, the replacements were known for that one song. This album was produced by a guy named Matt Wallace. You may know Matt Wallace from working with bands like Faith No More. Uh, that's the only record I think I own that he was the producer on. Also on Paul Westerberg's first solo album, 14 songs. He's also the producer on that. But what I didn't realize and was kind of a closely guarded secret in Replacements world was that before they met with Matt Wallace to record this album in Los Angeles at Cherokee Studios, they met with a different producer named Tony Berg. And Tony Berg uh, started the sessions up at a studio in upstate New York called uh, Bear in Bearsville, New York in 1988. And that's initially where the Replacements started recording the album. They worked on it for about two weeks Ultimately, it was not working out. They scrapped the project, the band went home, and then they decided to start working with Matt Wallace. In the late 90s, Warner Brothers Records put out this two disc, sort of best of collection of the replacements called All For Nothing, Nothing For All. Now, it, I put a best of in air quotes because it only included this stuff on Warner Brothers. The band's first four albums were on the independent label Twin Tone, their final four albums were on a major label with uh, Sire Warner Brothers. So this only included Warner Brothers stuff. So disc one were all songs off the album and disc two were all, at the time, previously unreleased songs or B-sides. And there were two songs that came out on this that were from that Bearsville session. But it was kind of, again, kept under the radar. So the songs Portland and Wake Up are on here. And those were, didn't appear on Don't Tell a Soul. And they were completely new at the time. And now we've learned those came from the Bearsville Sessions. After they scrapped these Bearsville Sessions, they did the record in California with Matt Wallace. Matt Wallace assumed that he would be the mixer on the album since he was the producer and engineer of the record. And they decided, no, that wasn't going to be the case. And he wanted to make his case for being the mixer, so he went into the studio, took all the tracks, and in one day, mixed the entire album. Now, anyone who knows anything about studio stuff knows one day to mix an entire album is not enough time. And it was pretty rough. And when they presented it to the record label, they didn't like it, and they wanted to go with someone else. Now, I've seen interviews recently where Matt Wallace talks about how what he should have done is focus on, say, two or three songs and really, really spend the entire day just working on those, sending those forward and saying, this is what the record could sound like if I mixed it. And that probably would have been a, a smarter strategy, but that's not the one that was employed. So he gave the whole album out. So the Warner Brothers didn't like it. They hired an outside producer named Chris Lord Algy, and Chris Lord Algy known then and now as a radio doctor, as somebody who does what it takes on records to get it to where the radio likes it. You know, put a lot of chorus on there, put a lot of reverb, do a lot of whatever. Um, just make it palatable to the radio. And that's what they did. And the number one complaint really about Don't Tell a Soul has always been that it sounds very much 1988-89. It sounds very dated. It doesn't sound edgy and like, you know, rough around the edges like the way the replacements had always been. And that's more than knock. I mean, some people will criticize the material, and I think m the songs are really good on the record. You know, I've said in past videos, and I, and I didn't coin this particular description or whatever, but the real battle with Don't Tell a Soul was always was, is it a bad album with some really great songs on it? Or is it a great album with a couple of clunkers on it? And I've always come down on the great album with a couple of clunkers, although I'm starting to reevaluate but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, I've gone back and forth with it, but I, I do ultimately come down on liking the album. It's nowhere near my favorite. Um, you know, if I ranked all the replacement studio records, it would be ranked eighth, probably, of the eight. But, again, eighth of a band that good, it, that's still 
excellent by anybody's standards. Now, a couple of years ago, Warner Brothers released the entire replacements catalog on expanded edition CDs. This one has Portland, it has Wake Up, it has Talent Show Studio Demo, and it has some alternate mixes of songs. So this was the first hint of what we were finding um, that would ultimately make up the box set. So if you do have this CD, the expanded edition of Don't Tell a Soul, you started hearing hints of this stuff. What I thought I would do is go through the record, okay, there's the Matt Wallace mix, which is the original mix of the album. There's the Bearsville Sessions, which was the aborted attempt to make the album. And then there's the double live album, and that's what's included in the box. I have a couple of comparisons that I want to show you that will, in some cases, go from Bearsville to the Matt Wallace mix to the finished product that you heard on Don't Tell a Soul. In some cases, it's just going to go from a Matt Wallace mix into the final mix. And in some cases, I want to show you something where Paul took a bit of a song that he was using that he scrapped and then put it into a song that you know. And um, I'll tell you what I think of that when we, when we get a little closer. So I think the most significant get in this entire box set is really the Bearsville stuff because most of this has never been heard of. And when you hear songs that you already know, like I'll Be You and Aiken To Be and I Won't and these kinds of songs from that album, when you hear the Bearsville version, it is very, very different. Now let me put on, uh, as, as, as a comparison, let me do the I'll Be You and show you the various ways that it changed. If there's a temporary law Why my bone right out of my skull And I'm dressing sharp and feeling dull So what you heard there was the band's most well-known song, I'll Be You, and you hear it in its original version when they were working on it at Bearsville. It's a little clunkier, it's a little looser, the lyrics were different if you hear it all the way through, but the song is basically there, it's just, it is noticeably different from when they took it to LA. Next was the Matt Wallace mix, where you hear the way that he intended the song to sound, and it's pretty similar to what you, the version you know. Now what I want to tell you about that is I took 15 seconds of each one. 15 of I'll Be You, Bearsville, 15 of I'll Be You, Matt Wallace Mix, and then I tried to go 15 of the original song, and what was 15 in the Matt Wallace Mix only took 13 seconds in the final mix, the Chris Lord Algae Mix, because one of the other tricks that they did in the song was speed it up. And it's listed in the box set that the president of Warner Brothers thought that was a hit but thought it needed to be faster and advised the mixer to make it a little bit faster. I never really thought, I didn't even know you could do that technically in the studio. Also what you hear with mostly with Chris Lord Alga is just a lot of chorus on the guitars, a lot of blending of all the instruments. You don't hear as much distinct guitar work. Replacements have two guitar players, right? There's Paul Westerberg and there's Slim Dunlap and they play different parts. And in the Matt Wallace mixes, that's what's most noticeable about the songs and what makes them so much different and in my opinion better is you hear so much more of their guitar interplay and it's really gone on the Don't Tell a Soul version that you know because it's just all blocked together and you can barely hear the, dis the differences at all, right? So I think this stuff is fascinating. One of the things that I think is fascinating is that song Portland that I taught, that I mentioned that was that came out 20 years ago on that Best Of. It's featured again on the Don't Tell a Soul CD, but here it is in context with the Bearsville session. So what I'm gonna show you now is how the song Portland was, a bit, was taken out and put into Talent Show. Talent Show, uh, when it was originally recorded as a demo, didn't have the, it's too late to turn back, here we go, it just faded. Portland is where they took that part from, they took it out, put it into Talent Show in the final version, and that's the version that you know, and Westerberg had no intention of you ever hearing the song Portland. So 
as you can see, Portland turned out to be kind of an alt country song. Um, brilliant, beautiful song. I think that It's Too Late to Turn Back Here We Go fits more with the theme of that song. But it was never used, and when you hear Talent Show today and you hear it, it says It's Too Late to Turn Back Here We Go. That's where it all came down, right? The, the Bearsville sessions are very significant from the point of view of just hearing this aborted, so what didn't work about it? Why, why did it not, you know, succeed? What was happening? What do these songs sound like? And really, some of them are great. In fact, you know, I think the Wheel Inherit the Earth was better at Bearsville than any of the final versions, personally. Chris Lord Algae final mix with all that extra and all that typing, all these noises. And then when you hear the guitars coming in, it's just all pressed together. Whereas in the original mix, you can really hear the distinctive parts. The Matt Wallace mix, hearing the way that he was the producer who was there at the sessions, thought the record should sound. And the difference between what a professional mix doctor, whose job it is to get shit on the radio, what they do is so vastly different, you know? And it's so much better the way it was intended to be. And I feel almost like this band was robbed. Robbed of what could have been a great album. Now, maybe without all that Chris Lord Algae nonsense, you wouldn't even know I'll Be You. The album wouldn't have sold as well as it did, about 350,000 copies at the time of its release in 89. They might not have gotten some of those opportunities that they got to tour with Tom Petty, etc. But we don't know any of that. And the fact is that don't Tell a Soul is the only Replacements album in their catalog that sounds dated. That sounds exactly like the year it came out. Please to Meet Me doesn't sound like 87. Tim doesn't sound like 85. Let It Be doesn't sound like 84. I mean, a little bit like 84. But um, most of their stuff doesn't sound like the year it came out. It has a more timeless quality. Whereas Don't Tell a Soul, because the mix has that thing there. I mean, it's just... it. it I don't know, it feels like I'm, I'm almost pissed about it, you know? Because so many of the reviews at the time, you know, the talk was like, oh, they're mature, they're this, they're that, and they, they were. But they didn't have to be mature and sounding like they were compromised, which is the way the record came out. So I'm gonna do a couple, one to two more of these comparisons so you can just sort of hear them, and then I'm gonna move on from that and we're gonna talk a little bit about the live record.
So I hope that those examples showed you something, that you were able to get something out of it with such brief 10 to 15 second examples. But hopefully, if you listen in headphones or if your, your YouTube is on your, your TV with a good system or whatever, that you could hear the distinctions. But it really does take listening to it. And I think some of the tracks are on YouTube, but I'd prefer you just bought the box set, honestly, and uh, just because I think everyone should own it. <laughs> just a little pitch for it there, you know. So a couple years ago when this one came out, The Replacements, for sale live at Maxwell's 1986, I did an extended video on it and talked about how great it was, of course, perfect. It's the original lineup, it's got Bob, it sounds great, it's like just, you know, phenomenal show, a great document of the band at that period. I predicted that if that collection was successful, that what you would hear next would be The Replacements Inconcerated the full version. Inconcerated was a promo EP that came out in 1989 to tie in with the song Aiken to Be, becoming the band's new single. And uh, when it came out, it had five live songs and Aiken to Be. And that was the only official live release of the replacements at the time. And it was the only official live release of the band while they were together. But it doesn't take a, a fucking detective to understand that you don't put in a mo bring a mobile studio to a show and record only five songs. Obviously, they recorded the whole set. Well, Dead Man's Pop now brings back that entire set, and you can hear it in its entire form, a good 90-minute set of the replacements, and they were fucking on fire that night. Now, the knock on the replacements live used to be sometimes that they got so drunk that they couldn't perform or that they could barely handle their instruments, they wouldn't even play their own songs, etc. And although they were still drinking pretty heavily, they weren't doing that by this point. By this point, they were playing their own stuff and they were definitely a killer live band. And now that Bob Stinson, the original guitar player, was out of the band and Slim Dunlap was in, some of that craziness of the live show was gone because Bob was the craziest of the crazy. And so, in some people, they kind of lament that and they think, well, that sort of sucks. Like, you know, Bob's out, fuck that. It's the whole edge of the replacement. Well, you know, I've talked plenty about Bob Stinson. He was great, he was a genius. But it was what the band needed to do. And I saw them so many times uh, with Slim you know, probably about 10 times on those final two tours that they did with when Slim Dunlap was the guitar player. And I really found him to be excellent live, you know? Yeah, he's not crazy. He's not wild. He's not wearing a tutu. He's not going out there naked or whatever and playing. He doesn't do that shit, but he does perform extremely well. He plays guitar great. And he's a partier, okay? I saw them in Green Bay on the, on the uh, All Shook Down tour. Slim was mid-set. He walked to the back of his amps placed his head up against his amp, back to the crowd, playing guitar at the time, puked, okay, it was coming out of his mouth. And while still playing, didn't miss a note, turned around, came back, finished the set, okay? So it's not like he wasn't out of control too, like the rest of them were, but he was able to sort of keep it together on set. The set itself is recorded at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, June 2nd, 1989. It features songs from all of their albums that were released at the time. It also it has a very rare live version of the song Cruella de Vil, which is from 101 Dalmatians, that the band recorded that song for a Disney compilation that came out back in 1989. And right before the song, Paul says, here's a song from a Disney thing that we got, you know, fucking tricked into doing. Thank you guys, thank you. We're doing on this, on this fucking Disney record that we got, we got totally tricked into doing. Okay, well they sort of explain that in the liner notes. I'll let you read that if you want to. I don't see how they could have been tricked into learning and recording a song, but whatever. He claims they were. It's good to hear it live. They didn't do it every night. They closed with Black Diamond, their Kiss cover, 
pretty much standard at that time. But it's a lot of songs from Tim and Please to Meet Me, which are great. This also happened to be the final tour with Chris Mars, the original drummer. And as I said, I saw them plenty of times on the All Shook Down tour. Enjoyed it every time. <clears throat> but there was a major difference between the way Chris Mars played drums and Steve Foley, his replacement, uh, <laughs> played drums. Foley was much more like a just a just keeping the beat, just rock steady, I'm a metronome, you know? He had no individual style. He had no swing. Chris Mars had his own style and his own swing. And it does sound better with him, you know, my, in my opinion. To, to, to conclude this video, I would just say that um, if you think the idea of revisiting a replacements album that many longtime fans consider to be their worst album, you think that's a dumb idea for a box set. Like, I understand where you're coming from, of course, but I think it, the genius of this particular box is it really does show how this album was really great and it was robbed of its place in the band's history. So, I cannot recommend enough this replacements box set. It is fucking amazing. I don't know what else they can mine in terms of doing this. I doubt they're gonna delve that deeply into any of their other albums. It just doesn't seem likely. Um, and you know, Paul Westerberg didn't even really have that much to do with this. He doesn't prefer to look backwards that much. The most they got him on was in the book. And so he didn't do any interviews. He didn't do, you know, it was all Tommy Stinson. So getting him to be involved is gonna be difficult, but hopefully they can come up with a workaround. Um, you know, I'd pay for a four CD box set of Tim to hear the, all of the various stuff. You know, I'd, I'd hear a whole disc of just Bob Stinson guitar solos if they could do that. But, um, you know, I understand that's like a real niche thing that not everybody would want to hear. Anywho, um, I'm gonna let you go here. I hope you got something out of this video. Buy the Dead Man's Pop box set. It is well worth your money. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.